Hey friends, welcome to Free Life Chapel, where we help you discover and live the free life in Christ. My name is Kadi, and I'm so excited that you decided to tune in with us today. Feel free to check out our website at freelifechapel.org to find out a little bit more about who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part. If you ever find yourself in the Central Florida area, come visit us. Free Life Chapel would love to connect with you. But until then, we have an amazing message in store just for you. I hope you're encouraged. Adventures in the Christ Life. I, I love the Indiana Jones series. I just do. Back in the day, even with all the really bad color and the really bad stunts and the really bad like special effects, uh, it's all good. And uh, we're, drawing, we're drawing some truths out of, out of this series as it's kind of talking to our faith. Week number one, we talked about the three different arcs. It was the, uh, the, he was searching for the Ark of the Covenant, right? And so we talked about the, the arcs and the Ark of Salvation, that relationship. Week two, we talked about the heart issues. There was a big bad guy who was after stealing Indiana Jones' heart. He was coming after his heart. And we talked about the fact that your heart is a mess also. Okay, tell somebody he's already talking to you. Just, just tell him he's already talking to you. Right? Your heart, my heart is a jacked up mess. That's what Bible says. Bible says your heart is deceitful. Who, who can even know it? It's wicked. It's crazy. You, do, you think some crazy stuff. People haven't said amen in church in 20 years, but you just said amen right there, and that, that's a good place to say. So we talked about Salvation week one, we talked about sanctification, heart issues week two. Today I want to talk to you about growing your spiritual life. How do we advance our spiritual life? In this, in this Indiana Jones series, this, the movie we're kind of looking at this week is The Last Crusade. Uh, anybody remember that movie? Anybody, anybody see Last Crusade? Okay, a few of you, good, good, good. I love you, love you. They're, they're searching for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail, it's a cup. They, 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 make it, they make it sound really good. It, it's a cup, the Holy Grail. And, and it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those iconic historical objects, quite honestly, that, that, that is talked about. And, and many, many archaeologists, they've actually searched for this. And what is the Holy Grail? It is, it is believed to be the final cup that Jesus drank communion from on, during the Last Supper. And then Joseph of Arimathea, who was there at Jesus' crucifixion, had that cup. Somehow he got the same cup, and he caught the blood of Christ dripping from the cross in that cup. Now, now that's what history says about the Holy Grail. And this is, the, this is the relic that Indiana Jones is after because if you find this cup, there's miracles connected to the cup. How many of you would love to find a couple of miracles in your life? Would that be all right? Yeah, of course you would. Y'all going to be looking under the bed when you get home, all that kind of stuff, right? In, 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 this, in this movie, there are these, the, the Nazis, I'm not sure how they got involved, but the Nazis are there, and they, they get James Bond. Well, it's, it's Indiana Jones' dad, is it Sean Connery. Uh, they, they get, they get, they get, how many of you know Sean Connery's the best uh, James Bond there ever was? Like, they, all these other guys, yeah, whatever. I, it's just my opinion. So they get Indiana Jones' dad in this, in this movie, and, 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 and they, they fatally shoot him. And in the movie line, the only hope they have is if Indiana can get the Holy Grail and pour some water out of the grail on him, and it will heal him and save him from the fatal wound that he has. That's, that's kind of how this goes towards the end. But I, I want to draw your attention for a couple of minutes to this cup. This cup, this, this holy grail, this, this cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. We do know this, although I, I can't tell you I've seen the holy grail. It's never been, quote unquote, found. I, I, I do know that Jesus participated in the Last Supper. And I do know, according to my Bible, that he drank from a cup as he was taking uh, having a meal with all of his disciples right before he was crucified. It's the last thing he did before crucifixion, and he's having a meal with all of his disciples. And according to even today, what's called a Passover Seder, that, that celebrated usually during the Easter time. Jews around the world will celebrate this in their home. But, but even in, in many of the Christian circles, we've held several seders here at Free Life Chapel. During that meal that is set up, there are four different cups, four different cups of wine that you drink from at prescribed times. And they all carry intentionally different meanings. 
They, they all look back to the Exodus. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he saved them from Pharaoh, from the bondage, the taskmasters. God said, I've got a plan for your life. He brought them out of Egypt and put them into a promised land. And here is, here is what those four cups of wine represent. Cup number one is the cup of sanctification. Where God said in Exodus, he said, I will bring you out of Egypt. And then cup number two is the cup of deliverance. He said, I will rescue you from bondage. Cup number three is the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. And that's where Jesus said, uh, God said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And then the fourth cup is the cup of praise. I will take you as my people. These four cups are very intentional. The first two cups happen before dinner. The last two cups are drunk after dinner. And it's very prescribed. And they all have the understanding that this is what they mean. Sanctification, deliverance, redemption, and praise. And you drink them at specific times. Jesus is with his disciples during the Last Supper. And he is the one that's leading them in this. And he gets to a certain part of, this, uh, of the Passover Seder and he starts talking about a cup and he said, this cup it's, represents my blood. There is a new covenant that I am giving you. He, he, he stops and he begins to talk about this and he connects this cup. He connects this cup to what he's about to go through on the cross. And then he proceeds with the Seder. This may give you some context as to what Jesus meant when he said this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Check this out. Read the highlighted parts. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I desire, but what you desire. That wasn't just Jesus talking poetically. He said, let this cup which cup is it? It's the, it's, it's the cup during the Seder. Well, well, there's four cups. Which one are you talking about? Jesus specifically was speaking to the third cup. Let this cup pass from me. In fact, when you and I take communion, the communion that we take is representing and connected to the third cup. Jesus is saying, I don't want to go through what I've got to go through to make this cup happen. It's not just wine in a cup. It's my blood that has to be in this cup if it's going to provide what cup number three does, redemption and blessing for people. It, wine can't do that. It's going to take a sacrifice, and it's going to take me to do it. And he says, I don't want to go through this. Let this cup pass from me in Luke chapter 22 verse 20 when Jesus was talking to the disciples about this cup during the Seder here's what he said this cup that is poured out for you is the new promise made with my blood he's speaking to the third cup this is really important because what Jesus is saying is when I go to the cross I'm making the third cup available to you it's empty unless I go do what I need to do at the beating, at the cross, at the burial. I've got to die. I've got to be busted open and fill this cup so that you will have redemption and blessing in life. Because what Jesus did when he went to the cross is he paid the debt for our redemption. And then he blessed us with freedom. Is anybody grateful that he paid a price you could not pay? He paid a debt he did not owe and has given us the blessing behind that. The four cups of this Passover, watch this, I'm, I'm just laying a foundation. They're the picture of your life. This is completely your life. And quite honestly, I'm kind of frustrated right now because we could do a whole message just on these four cups right now. But I don't have time. i got to go. But, but the, he, this is a picture of your life. Number one, sanctified. You've been set apart for God's purpose. Number two, you've been delivered. Freedom from bondage and freedom from your past. Anybody glad that when you say yes to Jesus, your past is gone? That, that it's got your reputation. It doesn't matter. You get to hit the reset button. That was then. This is now. This is what he did. 
sanctified, delivered, redeemed. You're blessed right here. Your future is ahead of you, which is praise, united with Jesus and your family forever. These four cups are a picture of your life with him, sanctified, delivered, redeemed, and living full of praise. And now, because Jesus did his part in the cup, now we are able to live strong, spiritual lives. I'm never saying you're going to be a spiritual giant, but I promise you, you can live strong for Jesus every day of your life. Yes, you can. Elbow three folks and tell them, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can live strong for Jesus for the rest of your life. It doesn't take superstars. There's no rock stars in this thing. Anybody fall down and mess up this week? If your neighbor didn't raise their hand, tell him you already lied this week. You've already lied one time this week. You, you liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah. We all, we all, we all have a, had a, we, we, we jack things up. We think we do crazy stuff. Anybody do something this week that you think, oh, that should never happen. I should never do that. And just, go, yeah, just raise your hand. You think a thought this week that you, that you would smack your kids if they thought that thought, but you thought it like several times. There's no rock stars in this. We don't have it all together. But we are able to engage it because of the price Jesus paid in this third cup so that we can move forward and we can live our lives strong for him. In, in, in this movie, I, I, I love this. Once we decide that the cup is, is, is amazing and it's got to be, be identified, we got to go after it. Then, then this is where Indiana Jones, Indy's dad, uh, he has this diary in, in the movie. And, and he's got these, he, in, in the diary, three keys to avoiding these three death-defying challenges that you're going to face as you're going after this holy grail. Like, you're going to have to go into this cave. What's it always got to be a cave? He's got to go into this cave area, and there's going to be three things you're going to face, three tests you're going to come up against. And he gives him three keys on how to get through these tests where others had failed, others died, others tried and didn't do it. How is it that you successfully get through and you win in this thing called life? The first one, the first trap was wonderful. It was this blade that was coming to cut his head off. That's just a wonderful thought right there. And, and here, here, here's, what, here's what Indiana Jones' dad kept telling him. Here, here's what was in the, in, in the diary. He says, only the penitent man will pass. Only the person who is repentant. Only the person who is sorry will pass. Indiana's coming up in, in, the, in the cave. There's spider webs and cobwebs everywhere. Oh, my. And he about, he's, well, he's about to walk through it. And he's repeating, the, the penitent man, the penitent man will be saved. The penitent. And it dawns on him. And in humility, he falls to his knees and the time he falls to his knees, the blade goes right over his head. Zing, done. So, so close. And, and, and he learned that, that key number one to living a strong Christ life is I need to be on my knees talking to God. If, if, if I'm going to live this life strong, I need to have a communication process with God. I, I, need, if, I heard it put this way. If he's your daddy, then call home every now and then. We need a prayer life. Watch, not just a prayer, a prayer life. Not just where I visit prayer here and then gone. No, a lifestyle of prayer that goes in day in and day out. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, here's what it says. Come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You and I have got to get to the presence of God and talk to him. I, I, I don't know what you're going through, what you face day in and day out. You don't have to be dressed a certain way. It doesn't have to be a certain time of the day. You don't have to have it all together. But you and I have got to go to him. And number one, the very first prayer we pray is a prayer of repentance where I admit I need you in my life. Life does not work without you. You are the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way to him except through you. Jesus, I need you. Repentance is where I'm repairing the relationship. How many of y'all are married in the room? How many of y'all are married in the room? Where are the married folks? Then you know what repentance is all about. And repentance helps to heal and repair the relationship. That's why we live a lifestyle of repentance. 
I keep coming back to God. God had a rough day today. And in that heartfelt love for him, I repair the relationship. I'm sorry I blew it. I'm sorry I didn't take care of this. Not because he's angry and going to throw elbows on me, but because I love him and I want to keep the relationship strong so I repair it through a lifestyle of repentance. But after you pray the prayer of repentance, would you please keep praying? Uh, worship is prayer. It's where you magnify God because life tries to make him small. I've got to put him back in his proper context. When you start talking to him, your peace gets stronger inside. You're reminded he's God, nobody else is. You're reminded he's in control, nothing else is. When you begin to worship him and sing his praises, that's what David was the best at. He talked about how great God was, how much greater he was than David's enemies, bigger than the lion the tiger, the bear, oh my, all of those things that David had to face God, he, as he worshipped his heart, his peace, his confidence in God grew. In, in prayer, ask. Ask God for direction. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for help. Ask God for strength. Don't just sit there white knuckling life. Go to him in prayer. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, come bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. If he holds everything you need, then go talk to him. He's a God that loves to give. Keep praying, surrender your life. In prayer, we surrender. I, God, use my life. Your will, not mine. That's what Jesus did. God, I don't want to go through this. Let this cup pass from me. Get me out of this. I don't want to go through this. Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. Ladies and gentlemen, when you take your fears and, you, and the concerns that you have to God, always finish it with a nevertheless because he's got a plan beyond what you can see. And you and I, our vision can be limited. And it could very well be that the greatest blessing of your life is down this path that you don't want to walk, but by his help, he will walk you and lead you through the valley of the shadow of death, but you would have no fear because he is with you. His rod and his staff, they come for you. It doesn't mean he takes it away. It just means he gets you through it. He knows how to get you where you're supposed to be. Trust him, but surrender your life. That's why First Thessalonians Thessalonians 5, 17 has the prayer. I've got the whole verse memorized. Maybe you do too. Here's what it says. Never stop praying. Would you read that with me? Ready? Never stop praying. Memorize it. Ready? Close your eyes. Never stop. You guys are Bible geniuses. You've already got it down. Never stop. How do, how, how do I got to go to work? No, you stay in a spirit, an attitude of prayer. You can, you can, you can pray when you're uh, in, in your car. God knows you got to pray over your kid. You can pray if you're at court. You can pray while you're at work. You can pray when you're in school. Pray while you're laying in bed. You can pray when you're getting out of bed. You, you, you pray during prayer week. We're going to be right here. We're praying. We're talking to our heavenly Father. Ladies and gentlemen, everything happens after a man. When you pray. See, Jones, he proves that prayer will keep you from losing your head. You'll get that later. <laughs> the second trap he had to get through, he had to take the right steps or he would fall. There was, this, there was this thing set up. There were stones everywhere. And they had hieroglyphic letters on them, and he had to know how to spell the name Jehovah. And so he had to step on the right stone in order to get across this chasm because if he stepped on the wrong stone, the whole thing would fall and it was over. You see, the second, king, the second key to living a strong life in Christ is you got to learn who God is. You need to know his name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Jenny, singing my message all over again. I, you, you, you and I need to know who he is. Do you know that in the Bible there's over a thousand names, titles, and attributes of your God? Don't just call him God. He's also truth. He's also mercy. He's also faithful and good and kind. The, the, a thousand ways to describe him and it doesn't scratch the surface of his reality. 
I want you to understand, if you and I are living our life with no Bible, we learn who God is through his word. If I'm going to learn where to step in life, I need to know what his word says so that his name becomes real to me and I know who he is and how to handle the situations I'm facing in life. Oh, you're going to face some stuff that your name is not going to get you through. You're going to need a name higher than your name. And it's not going to be your mama or your grandmama or your mama's grandma. No, you're going to need Jesus in the situation. But you just can't pull Jesus' name out and act like you've... No, no, no. It's those who know him. It's, it's, you see, when, when, when Malachi, when he starts to say my name, when he says Saba, that is different than anybody else when they say Saba. It does something to me because of relationship. And when you've got relationship with, he with heaven, when you've been talking to God and you evoke his name in your situation, when you don't know how to handle it, but you're Jesus. It just, it just takes mentioning his name. You don't have to pray a paragraph prayer. You don't have to pray in King James. You don't have to have it together or no, be churchy. You just got to speak his name, Jesus, and in the middle of that, because I know who he is and because he knows who I am, something happens in that situation that wakes me up and I know everything is going to be fine. That's why we got to know our word. No, if, you, if there's no Bible, you're living weak. If there's no word, we're living tired, vulnerable, stuck, hopeless, full of fear. Those things rule and reign in our life. But when the word kicks in, everything changes. Psalm 119 tells me that the word protects me from my own deceitful heart. And it's a light in dark times that gives me direction. Matthew 22 tells me that, that, that God's word awakens God's power in my life. Could you use Use more spiritual power in your life. It's found in the word. Proverbs 30 says that God's word is a shield that protects my life. When the enemy's trying to get to your life, get to your mind, get to your kids, he runs into the word because the word is standing and the word is immovable and unshakable. It stands the test of time. Hebrews chapter 4 says that it's a weapon to humiliate and defeat the enemies of your life. Isaiah 55 says the word that there's nothing Nothing that can stop the word of God. It will not return void. If it was sent out on a mission, it will accomplish what God sent it to do. You can hold on to it. Put an anchor to it and watch it work in your life. James chapter 1 says the word will transform your life. John chapter 1 says the word was here before creation and Matthew 24 says the word will still be here after heaven and earth is gone. The word remains. FLC, let me help you with something. Turn off the opinion of man and turn on the word of God and let this feed your heart. Let it feed your mind. Let it feed your spirit. Let it feed your family, your career, your health, your dreams, your hopes, your joy. The word of God is the answer. Discover God by learning the word. Build your life on it. Defy your enemies by it. Outlast storms through it and win in life because the word will get you through it. You're going to live strong for Jesus? I've got to have a prayer life. I've got to have a prayer life. I've got to be connected and talking to him. If I'm going to live a strong, victorious life in Christ, I gotta know his word. I gotta know what he said. If somebody that you love writes you a letter, you don't just leave it unopened. You grab it and rip into it as soon as they, you see who it's from. Ladies and gentlemen, 66 book love letter written just to you. He says, if you just open it, I got some things to tell you that you've never heard before. I wanna show you some stuff. Prayer, the word, and then there's this third one. This third trap was interesting that he, Indy had to get through. He had to cross this chasm. He's on a rock ledge here, and he had to go to the rock ledge over there, but there wasn't no bridge. Great big deep chasm. If he steps off, it's over, it's done. How do I get from here to there in this situation? And, and while Indy is in this state and his dad 007 is laying there on the ground and he's been fatally, fatally wounded. And his dad is repeating these words. He's saying, Just believe, Indy. Just believe. Just believe. Just believe. And then Indy starts thinking about his dad's, his dad's uh, diary. Just believe. Just believe. All of it is building because it was going to take a leap of faith. 
to make this happen. The third key to living strong in Christ is you're going to have to live by faith. That means sometimes you have to get out of your head and get into your spirit. Mm, oh, no, no, that, that, that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 7. This is a great tat. You ought to get this one right here. Romans 1, 7 says this. The one who is righteous will live by faith. That means it doesn't always make sense. That means there is a crisis by what you see, but what you know is something different. When I don't see a way, God does. When I don't understand, he does. As long as I'm hooked to God, I'm never lacking in my life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That doesn't mean you don't want him. That means there's no lack, there's no want in your life. This is critical that we understand faith is important. Let me tell you what faith is. Because some of us have the wrong mindset, the wrong definition of faith. You don't think you have faith, but I want to show you what faith is. Not, not what we've been taught for so long. Not what's popular in culture. Let me show you faith from Jesus' culture. Jesus' mindset. How he was raised. This is what faith means. Faith is persistence over confidence. It's not that you so believe that you disregard everything else. That's not faith. That's just increasing your intellect and increasing information. But ladies and gentlemen, let me help you. Your your, your noggin, your head, as sharp and as brilliant as it is, you're going to face some things that your head can't work out. You're going to hit some situations in life that don't look good and you don't see a way from here to there. I don't understand. And according to what my Bible tells me, it's going to take faith in order to live righteous, to live right, to be connected, experiencing all that God says I can have. How do I do that? It's not because I just have greater intellect. It's because even with the lack of my understanding, I've learned to trust his word and I'm going to step even when I don't understand. Because if you said it, I'll trust it and I'll understand it later step first understand later step first understand oh I know that's messing with your head right now I know what I'm saying step first understand later step first feel good about it later but step based on what his word says you see this why it all goes together I've got to I've got to begin to talk to him I need a relationship that takes me to his word his word begins to speak to my life so that when I hit places that I can't get across now I know what to do My talking to him has built my confidence in our relationship. His word has given me direction for my life. And so I don't have to understand it or have it it all figured out. I just got to know who he is and believe if God said it, that settles it. Let's go. I can get this thing done. Yes, it's critical to understand this. We, We move. People of faith don't have the Bible figured out. People of faith still have doubt, fear, and questions. We, 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 we still go through it. There's no spiritual giants that we're just walking through unscathed that nothing is going to rock us. We are just people. People of faith are, are those who have learned to keep moving towards Jesus despite how they feel, despite what people did, despite what people said, despite how bad things look, even though the circumstances are against me. We just keep moving. And sometimes, sometimes life makes the next step look impossible. Some of you in this room are facing some things right now that you don't even know how you're going to get through this upcoming week. You're in church, and I'm glad you're here, and we can put on the nice stuff, and we can come in, and we raise our hands, and we can sing, and I love that. That is your faith in action. You're moving towards him. I applaud that. But if I got into your head and asked you, based on what's going on financially, what's going on in the family, what's going on with the kids, what's happening in the career, you're at a place where I don't know. I'm supposed to be there. I'm standing here, but there's no way to connect the two. I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. Have you ever been stuck? I love God and I'm stuck. I love God and I'm afraid. I love God and I have no answer. I love God, but I'm here. We all do. Sometimes the next step looks impossible. It did for Israel when they're coming out of Egypt and they faced the Red Sea. No one's ever saw water stand up before. 
Oh, it really looked bad in the lion's den. But Daniel slept with lions all night. It, it looked bad for the woman who was sick with the issue of blood who had spent all of her money and had not gotten better. In 12 years, she's still in the same situation. I, 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 life throws the impossible at us. The doctor's report, what the spouse said, your job, the text message you got before church, all of these things hit and we feel paralyzed by, some, by, by things that happen in life. So my question is this, how do you move forward when the life has destroyed the bridge? How do I get from here to there? How do I cross, a, how do I keep moving in life? I'm just gonna tell you what 50 years of faith has taught me. That's right, I'm the old guy. I asked Jesus in my heart when I was five years old, I will be 55 next month, so I'm gonna give you 50 years worth of experience here. Here's what 50 years of faith has taught me. Number one, impossible situations are coming to everybody. Just deal with it, it's coming. When they hit, they'll go, oh my God, stop it, we're all going through it. It sucks on every level, but it, it's there, whoop, there it is, it's coming. Things you can't control, things you can't change. If you would, you could. Uh, if you could, you would. No, it, it can. Impossible situations are coming. Number two, you'll never convince doubt to believe. You've got to defy it. Do you know why doubt is so powerful? I've taught you this. Because doubt makes sense. The doctor said you're sick. Well, I believe I'm going to be healed. I doubt it. Why? What cause? I don't know that a miracle can happen like that. It makes sense. I want to jump off this building and fly. I doubt it. That makes sense. Doubt is powerful because it connects, it resonates. We're trying to fill in the blanks in life and make it rational, makes it, and, and doubt makes sense. So you can't convince doubt to believe. You just got to fight back with faith, doubt the doubt. Doubt the doubt. Defy. you got to defy the doubt. Doubt the doubt. Defy it. Number three, we defy doubt by jumping out on God's promises. Not because it makes sense, but because he said so. I've got to make this truth a reality greater than my present circumstance. That if God said it, he can do what he said. And so how do we do that? Number one, we pray. Yes, pray. Number two, yes, we study God's word to understand God's strategies, God's ideas, God's thoughts, God's direction. I need those in my life. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of folks who are praying and studying but not doing step three. And step three is you got to do something. You just got to move now. If we're going to live this life for Christ, if you're going to experience the fullness of everything he said, you're going to have to do something to take a step. You're eventually going to have to leave where you are and move forward. Even when things look bad, even when things look rough, even when things don't make sense, you're going to have to reach out and get a handful of hope. Oh, hope is the rope. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. That, that there is some hope in life. Can I remind you that the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that, that faith is the substance of things first hoped for. Hope exists before faith shows up. Hope has to be there before faith can take. Hope sees faith steps. Say it with me. Hope sees faith steps. You got, you got to get some hope. You see, you got to get a handful of hope. You can walk on nothing because you have a handful of everything. When you get a handful of hope, you see, let me put it this way. It's when you and I lose hope that everything crashes and burns. Because without hope, I can't have faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you and I have got to walk in some hope that does not make sense. God, you told me in your word that you were good with what you would do. And I'm holding on to you because there's nothing that I can look to under my feet that can hold me. So it's time for me to shift my focus and start looking above my head. Looking down gets me nowhere. Looking up takes me everywhere. Looking down creates fear. Looking up creates faith. Looking down, I see the problem. Looking up, I see my master. Looking down. I gotta get some hope. 
Where does hope come from? Jesus is the source of your hope. But once you get some hope in your life, you don't just get a hold of hope, you get a hold of the rope of hope because you gotta, you gotta move with faith. You see, here's how I would put it. When hope grips, faith flies. Hope is the rope, but the swing is the thing. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to tell you today. It, Indiana was on one side and he needed to be on the other side. And there was no way. You and I have been on one side of life and we needed to cross to the other side and there was nothing in between, nothing to connect it. It didn't make sense. And sometimes you can't just pray and you can't just study. Those are precursors. But then you got to move. You got to jump. You got to step. You got to do something. Anybody here? Y'all don't get what I'm telling Eventually, going to have to leave the ground and start to trust the one who's above your head. You got to move in faith. I'm praying. I'm talking. I've got your word. It's my direction. You said the step, but it's going to take faith. Get a handful of hope. Take the leap of faith and watch what God will do. If you're going to live this life, if you're going to do it the way He said, you got to step in faith. Stand to your feet, everybody. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Pray, but that's not enough. Read the word, but that's not enough. Eventually, you got to do something with it. Would you turn it? Tell somebody, do something with this stuff. Do, do something with this stuff. Move your faith. For some of you, a step of faith is starting Connect Four. I'm moving my life forward. For some of you don't connect for, it's time to start serving. For some of us, a step of faith is, I'm, I'm going to begin to share my faith. For some of us, a step of faith is, I'm getting the Bible. I'm, I'm going to start like just, just a couple of minutes a day. I'm going to start reading my Bible. Yes, that's awesome. I've got to start. I've got to move. Put your life in motion towards Jesus so that there is action. Activity. It's not just Sunday. I'm glad you're here on Sunday. It's wonderful. It's amazing to see you. This is a, an initial great step. But we got to get Jesus out of Sunday. Get him into Monday. Get him into Tuesday. He's allowed into Wednesday. Take him to Thursday. What about Friday? Saturday, he's going to get him out and get him into your life. Get him into your week. We got to go with this. What will you do? What will you do to move your life forward? We got to trust God. It's time to walk on water. It's time to sleep with the lions. It's time to walk through the furnace. It's, it's time to defeat hurt. It's time to overcome fear. It's, it's, it's time to push back on loss and realize, God, you're good, and you can take me through this and just walk through it. Get up and jump. What have you not tried because you're still looking down? It's time to move. Today, we move. Father, we refuse to stay stuck on the wall when you've called us to the other side. There's more. There's greater. There's life, peace, hope, joy, promise, contentment, a reality in you that only you can give. Today we're coming after you. Thank you for the opportunity to pray. Oh, to, 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 to share our heart, to speak our heart to you. Thank you for giving us an audience with you day in and day out. Any moment of the day we can pray and we know that you hear us. Thank you as we pray. T today, God, I thank you that your word is ours. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Your word shows us how to step, how to live, what relationship looks like, how to handle single life, how to handle married life, how to handle retired life. You show us every aspect of life. Thank you for your word. 
But God, you, you've told us that we gotta, we got to activate the faith now. We got to take the prayer. We got to take the word. And it's time to move forward. It's time to try things that look impossible in the natural. But through prayer and your word, we get direction for our life. And we're going to step and watch you build a bridge. We're going to step and watch you carry us over. We're going to keep our eyes up, not down. We're going to get a grip, a hold of hope. And since you're the one that's our hope, we're anchored in you. We can swing across anything when faith decides to step. Today, God, we see the promise. Today, we see see where we want to be. We see where we're supposed to be. Now we step in faith. Now we're coming after you today. I pray for my friends in this room, those watching online, my brothers at Polk CI who feel stuck in their situation. We're going to up our game. We're going to up our life. We're going to step towards you. I'm not living in this season anymore. I'm moving out and I'm coming at you. God, today I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would inspire. I pray that your spirit and your love would wrap arms around people and remind them that you're for us and not against us that the best days are still ahead of us it's not over we've not reached the limit this is not the end another step is here and today God we step into that massive army of people who have had to trust you who've had to swing across empty places who've had to go through the impossible it's always happened with those that you love but God we learn to trust you more we learn that you're good we learn your power we learn your miracles in our life and today we say yes we're coming after you God God, all of my friends in this room, bless them, encourage them, lift them, remind them that you're for them and that it's not over. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.